Good afternoon, everybody, and um, thank you so much for inviting me here today. Um, and absolutely, second, Alistair's um, congratulations to you all um, for achieving chartership. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm a chief executive, but I'm also proud to say I'm a card-carrying conservator. And um, for those of you who don't know ICON, it's the Institute of Conservation, and we are the professional body for conservation of cultural heritage in the UK, except for buildings. Um, we are not venerable and we are not large. We, are, we came together in 2005, converging five bodies. However, our predecessor bodies go back, trace their origins back to 1950. And we have about 2,400 members, the vast majority are practitioners conservators and allied professionals. So I'm going to be very short and sweet and start with um, what I'm going to try and do is talk about where we are. Um, we've um, built the foundations of our profession and um, we have set ourselves on course for authoritative campaign of advocacy and our future focus is going to be about gaining wider recognition. So what have we done? Um, I'm incredibly proud of our record, I have to say, which is why I've put on this very long, boring list of things. But I really wanted to stress that the professional standards, where we started with this whole development, happened a long time before ICOM actually existed. It was our predecessor bodies um, working and building on um, creating professional standards by the profession for the profession. We consulted widely on these and we everything that we've done since then has followed and been built on those professional standards. We've established professional accreditation. We have approximately 800 accredited professionals. Our accreditation framework is accessible. It's based on outputs both at assessment and at C mandatory CPD. We have work-based training model framework and a qualification. And all of this, of course, links education to work, um, creates uh, the, a workforce that employers want and attracts funding. We have a register of professional practices uh, which give public access to pract qualified practitioners and last year, we have a new code of conduct, which brings us in line with other professions, which is, yay, enforceable, unlike our code of ethics, which was not enforceable. We've done research, conservation labor market intelligence research done by Kenneth Hson. We now know who we are, where we work, and what we do. And interestingly, we found out that a third of the work places in our sector are in the private sector, and we think that this is a trend and therefore looking to the future there. We have a strategy for skills and uh, education, and we are undertaking a governance review. So, the future. Our future focus is on gaining this wider recognition, because no matter you know, we spent a lot of time developing our frameworks, building our standards, and so on and so forth. But this, I don't think we've reached this recognition that we need from the public. Um, we need to clearly distinguish what a professional <coughs> conservator is. And I think we can say the professional conservator is the accredited conservator. But where does that leave? the 2100, no, sorry, my, my maths are all wrong, 1600 members who aren't accredited. Where does it leave them? They think they're professionals. Where do we go with that? Um, so we're looking at our membership um, categories and we're looking at about um, marketing much more effectively. We need to educate the market. Now, we're not alone in needing to educate the market. We know that we need to create a demand for professionally qualified cons uh, professionals, conservators, and we, in order to do that, how do we do that? We have to do this working together. And so we're working with the Historic Environment Forum Task Force, 
uh, Chartered Institute for Archaeologists is on that task force, and we're trying to um, develop a collaborative. Uh, REBA is on it, RSCS is on it. We, we're working together on this. Um, we are also thinking about seeking external validation. Now, one way of doing that would be through chartership, and we are uh, sort of, you know, getting to the point where we need to consider chartership. But um, we're also thinking about validation, of course, is something that we've avoided doing in the past. We're not, not absolutely sure what direction this will take us in, but certainly thinking about, about those um, as future possibilities. Um, the, I think the, the really key thing is widening our reach, um, and it's a nut we haven't cracked. I'm being absolutely honest here. Uh, it's a nut we haven't cracked. And um, I, I really love the be a beacon, you know, Andy's be a beacon, that, you know, our, our professional body and the professionals within it are the beacons, and they demonstrate the standards, but they also kind of build a, a, a community, a public um, growing wider community of people who want to care for the heritage um, and facilitate this public engagement. So we need to bring more people into the circle of the profession. Um, it doesn't mean they have to become professionals, but we want to bring them into the circle. And I think one of the conversations that we're having at ICON right now is how much resource do we put into that and where do we go with that direction? Building a new membership category of supporters, getting that all on board, making this, reaching out, and how much are we a professional body? I can see that you're asking me to stop. So, I think, I will end by saying, I think that's critical for the survival of the heritage, and I think it's critical for the survival of the profession. So, thank you very much. Um, yes, for the IHBC, um, we are a charity. We are um, started life as the Association of Conservation Officers. Um, in 1981, but we made um, a transition in 97, so we, we reached 18, we're now adults, fortunately. Um, we're like ICON, um, we're quite small, we've got about 2,200 members, but we've got a really dynamic membership, um, we've got a number of uh, members from all sorts of different professions, um, a lot of architects, surveyors, town planners, people who have got sort of dual membership. And then we've also got a significant number of members who are IHBC, and I include myself in it. I am maintained, I'm still a practicing uh, uh, conservation professional as I spend half my week in Surrey, England, but then the other half of the week working for IHBC. So I'm still very much part of the profession and very much aware of the, the issues that we're all facing. Um, just by sector. A lot of people still think that we're very much the home of the conservation officer. We're not. There's a good chunk of um, our members that are within the private sector, and this is ever growing given the, the issues that are happening within the public sector. And I've, um, I, about four years ago, actually took the removal of money and ran from local public and um, went and did my own little project elsewhere, which was exciting, but not to the, the forum in which to tell you about that. Um, <laughs> my uh, job title on that, um, learning, education, training, and standards. It really is a big deal for the IHBC in terms of getting another member of staff. Um, it's very much about us supporting our members, about their needs, um, about our standards, and what I'm looking at in terms of how we um, support our members is through the membership process and maintained through ongoing CPD. And it really is important to us. It's an absolute requirement of our members to undertake their CPD. And um, there was a, a, a point made yesterday about how um, conservation professionals are becoming aware of even particularly make me think of you know, conservation is less spotted, overworked conservation officer, they're becoming fewer and fewer, um, you just can't find them anywhere. Um, so for us as an organisation, it's about supporting that, as they make that transition as a sole voice within local government, but have the management network around them to become sole practitioners, being completely on their own. And through our branch networks, what we want to do is to make sure that they do feel that they have got that support. That's so important for the future of our members. Um, and it's my role is very much supporting that branch network. Um, CPD really, really important. That's how a lot of our members are going to, you know, sort of continue to be <coughs> professionals. 
And we're also very aware of the fact that a lot of formal CPD is so difficult to get you know, time and your employee to pay for it that we're not prescriptive about how you obtain that. So it could be you know, something very formal like this conference or um, hands-on and self-directed. That's actually my husband in France learning to how to plaster. And it was actually technically his CPD assisted by all of you with the cat. Um, but as a conservation <laughs> professional, I include myself. You've got this sort of innate passion for historic buildings and the historic environment and, and you want to know stuff, you want to continue learning and what we can do as an institute is help our professionals to continue to have that passion, particularly in times of difficulty when your motivation can hit, hit rock bottom. Um, our resources, uh, we've got tons of stuff on our website, there's absolutely loads. We also have the old school approach of uh, our publications yearbook and contact. Please do help yourself to them on our stand, uh, we're very welcome to them. And also, I quite like the, the Generation Z thing, we're really getting into that. We've got great stuff on LinkedIn, Storyfy and Twitter, it's sort of so a lot of the, the younger members of the organisation are trying to encourage people to get involved, to have that quick, instant, rather than to sit and read a book. I'm kind of on the sort of border of wanting stuff instantly, but I still like to read a book. I like the pages. Um, raising awareness, so not just internally, it's externally about how we want to make sure that you know people are aware more so about conservation, that it's there in the mainstream practice. So working with our friends in the RICS and the Reaver, actually getting um, much more knowledge out there, helping to increase um, uh, knowledge through our branch led training it's not just for our members we, we welcome people from all you know walks of the built environment profession and outside if they wish to and because we're such a small organization it's about making those connections um, and you know spreading the conservation word we're quite a small sector with lots of us individually that we've collectively got a much greater voice so yeah spreading the conservation word um, the, uh, Gus Lassie Stewart Award, it's a bit of a shameless plug. Um, you see the flyers on the tables on the, uh, in the main room. Um, we do welcome entrants from all sectors. It's not, it's not just got to be a historic environment, but in your dissertation or whatever your study was. I've just very luckily actually had a commendation for my work, which I was really chuffed to bits, but no nepotism whatsoever. This was way prior to me actually being employed by the IHBC. Um, but the focus of my work was about um, knowing about professional heritage skills and we know what we don't know but it's more about how we communicate outside our sector to the mainstream built environment sector and to the wider public as well and I've got this unique opportunity of being working for the HBC and actually being able to put my findings into practice about advocating and making those connections and another thing that we do is we have our course connection days and it's not it's for all sorts of different conservation courses that aren't necessarily recognised by the HBC but helping and welcoming to practitioners into the conservation fold. So the future is fundamentally is my role is about providing support uh, for our professionals and making sure they can be the best professionals that they can through their ongoing CPD and helping them to maintain that passion and making them feel motivated when you know they are feeling a bit low, particularly our fellow from our conservation officer colleagues. Raising awareness, we do a lot of lobbying with government, we perhaps can do that even better if we work collaboratively. Um, and also part of the, my own study was about getting mainstream um, education to be more aware of conservation, having just done a surveying course where there was no conservation content in it whatsoever. Um, and then going back to this about partnership and collaboration, we can do far more together, I think, if we work, we do work collectively, which perhaps got to be, I think, even more so in the future. So that was my whistle stop tour. Um, you can visit us on the web, um, find any information at the stand or on Okay, um, so I'm going to um, read Alex's paper. Um, the Institute achieved star uh, charter status in June uh, 2014, so it's still very recent for us. Um, achieving the status has been a long term objective in our strategic plan and something we're now very proud to have achieved. But the purpose of talking now is to tell you a bit about what we're now doing with our chartered status. Our current strategic plan has been in place since 2010 and builds obviously on previous long-term plans. And all of the activities we're engaged in now 
um, are based around the plan with the aim of achieving the individual targets under each of six objectives. And our objectives are as follows. To increase the understanding of the role of archaeologists in society and improve our status, to inspire excellence in professional practice, strengthen the relationships between archaeologists across the historic environment and other sectors, to make CIFA membership and registration essential demonstrations of fitness to practice, to develop a stronger influence on historic environment policy, and to give archaeologists a credible, effective, and efficient professional institute. It's just a small list of things to do. So, charter status is a significant achievement under the first objective out of those six. So, since acquiring our charter in June last year, we started to um, do more work to promote the Chartered Institute. And we've been working with our consultant, Stephen, from Allowed Marketing to help us approach and, and speak um, more to other professional institutes and through them to introduce um, ourselves better to the client sector, Objective 3. And we think already that chartered status has opened more doors for us and opened up new opportunities that weren't really apparent before we changed our status. Our first major publication, CIFA, which was launched very recently in March, is our latest professional practice paper uh, called Professional Archaeology, a Guide for Clients. And this is aimed at uh, anyone who needs to meet the requirements of legislation or policy that relate to archaeology. So it explains what you need to do and why you need a professional archaeologist to help you do it better. So over the coming months, we will be promoting this guide and its messages using our consultant, who's been extremely useful, I think, in, in helping us deliver these messages. And um, through the introductions we're making in the client sector, we'll be continuing to promote the importance of professional membership and the use of accredited organisations and individuals on projects. An example of this is for is in um, the really big uh, government infrastructure projects that are coming forward where we think this is a, a really important opportunity. In addition, our charter status has increased our profile with our advocacy work um, and we will continue to comment on and be involved in as much as we can on the proposed changes to legislation, um, to guidance, to advice and um, I think this from my perspective, you know, speaking sort of first hand, going to meet civil servants and politicians, I think had, having the, the sort of formal recognition of becoming a chartered institute, I feel definitely gives us more of um, a platform for those negotiations and discussions. Um, as well as our external work, then obviously we will go on with promotion, recruitment and development within the sector. Uh, charter status already seems to have made something of an impression with the academic um, area of the sector, universities and other academic institutions. And um, Alex hopes that um, any of you who are in what might be seen as the sort of sister session of this, the future of our profession session this morning, you might already have heard about career pathways that we're putting in place which aims to promote membership to paid and unpaid archaeologists, both in the UK and overseas, um, promoting training and professional practice. And we hope that there will be in the future much closer working with these academic institutions, helping to ensure that new entrants who come into the profession will already be on one of these career pathways. So, in conclusion, we're well aware that Charter isn't the answer to everything, um, but it's given us some great new opportunities. It's a stage on the development, the, the pathway, the pathway, the course of development of our institute. We need that to seize the opportunity, make the most of it. And over the five remaining years of our current strategic plan, we think it will have made a significant contribution 
to helping us demonstrate that we're a credible, effective, and a proficient, uh, uh, an efficient professional institute for all our members. Thank you.